Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship for Mount Auburn Presbyterian Church on September 6th, 2020. We are happy that you have joined us today, and we hope that you will find this to be a time of grounding and centering yourself and returning to the anchor of faith and community. Through the wonder of technology, I am here on the screen with you today, but I am actually on vacation, and so although I will be uh, leading us in communion and giving the benediction today, uh, Jim Brazell will be delivering our sermon, and so we welcome him to our virtual pulpit today. Thank you again for joining us, and let us worship God together. Call to worship. We are many, yet one, scattered, yet united. Whatever your gift, teaching, giving, encouraging, truth-telling, justice-seeking, trailblazing, quiet caring, feeding, organizing, challenging, subverting, provoking, whatever your gift, you are needed. You are wanted. You matter to this body, and we cannot be who we are called to be without you. So come, bringing your mind and your heart and your body and your spirit to love God with your whole self and to find yourself renewed and transformed. Come, it is time to worship. scripture readings is Romans chapter 13 verses 8 through 14. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you should not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desire. Today's lesson is the story of the Holy Family. The Holy Family is very important and is the family that we talk about a lot in a lot of the lessons and especially near Easter and Christmas time. So first in the Holy Family, we have the Christ child, the little baby Jesus. And if you can see his arms are, out, are outstretched to give the world a hug. And this is Jesus when he was just a baby. And then of course we have Mother Mary, who we wouldn't have Jesus without her, and the Father Joseph. We have the donkey that Mary rode when Mary and Joseph were going to Bethlehem to be counted by the Roman soldiers. Mary was really pregnant at this time with Jesus, so she had a really big belly. So it, it was really hard for her to walk such a long distance with such a pregnant belly. So she would ride the donkey, but actually even riding the donkey was really hard. So she would sometimes walk and go back and forth. So it was a really tough journey. Here is the cow that was in the manger and saw Jesus in his feeding trough and when Jesus was born. So this is what we represent as the cow who gave up even his home and his feeding trough for this really important moment. Here we have a shepherd, which really there were many shepherds in the field and a sheep, which really there were many more than just one, but we just have this to represent it because the shepherds were in the field herding their sheep when they saw the bright light and they heard the noises and they were really scared, which I would be really scared too if I was in a field and I saw all these bright things and I heard all these singing voices. But then they weren't afraid anymore when they heard the angels saying, do not be afraid, we bring peace and goodwill. And then the uh, shepherds were told to go to Bethlehem because such an important thing was going on that the baby Jesus was being born. So then they went and they followed it and they weren't scared anymore. Here we have the three kings, the three wise men. They were thought of as magical because they knew so much about everything. That's why they were called wise because they had so much knowledge and they especially had so much knowledge about the stars. So when the three wise men saw the bright star in the sky that was leading them to Bethlehem, they were, they knew that it was out of place. They knew all of the stars. So they were curious and they followed it. They're also called the three magi, which meant magic because the people would call them magical. And that's where we get our word magical. And they brought with them when they went to see Jesus being born, they brought the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So here we have back to the baby Jesus who ended up growing up to be a grown man who died on the cross, which is really sad, but also was really wonderful in an Easter way. And because he died for us. So see, here we have him outstretched, giving a hug. And we know that 
even when he was on the cross, he still had his hands out like this and he was outstretched, giving the world a hug, giving us a hug. And we know that he was not then, he is now and always. Thank you. So I wonder, what do you think is the most important part of the Holy Family? Which member do you think was the most important part or do you think that they all played an equal role? And I wonder where you see the Holy Family and their character traits in our church family or in your family. Good morning. I'm Jim Brazel. I'm a retired pastor within the Presbytery. I have the honor of working with your pastor on Committee on Ministry. I have been here before as a supply preacher, and I like to consider myself a friend of the Mount Auburn congregation. Let us continue in our worship of God. Here the second reading, the Gospel according to Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to tell it, to listen even to the church, let, so, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I truly tell you, if two or three of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Matthew 18 addresses how to deal with broken relationships within the congregation. The passage is one of the few in the gospel that mentions the word church. Matthew's community of faith dealt with internal struggles and recalled these words of wisdom from Jesus to provide encouragement and assistance when dealing with the communion of saints and the forgiveness of sins. I'm unsure if the fashioners of the Apostles' Creed insisted on a causal connection between those two phrases, but they certainly understood life within congregations. I find myself asking, how long would it take a congregation to process from a hurtful action between two individuals to expulsion of a member from the group? The passage suggests that there are breaks and pauses built into the process, listening sessions, as members each tell their stories and listen for the truth that each story shares. At each point, there are places, if the member listens, where repentance, restitution, reconciliation, and restoration would resolve the conflict. I ask myself, how long would this whole process take? I'm concerned here for the health of a majority. It seems to be too easy a thing for persons and positions to become polarized, and exclusion becomes a mechanical process that cares nothing for the offense or the offender, but that decency and order are maintained. This congregation, and our Presbytery and Synod and General Assembly have all endured the consequences of strong-arm politics as usual. Now there is something to be said for standards. In our own book of order we hold these truths, that God alone is Lord of the conscience and hath left it free from human doctrines and commandments which are in anything contrary to the word or beside it in matters of faith and worship, and that in perfect consistency with the above principle of common right, 
Every Christian church is entitled to declare the terms of admission into its communion and upon the whole church in whose name they act to censure or cast out the erroneous and scandalous, observing in all cases the rules contained in the word of God. So, believe as you are called to believe, as you understand by the Spirit of Christ, but take counsel that no one is free from the consequences of their belief. That's about as good as Presbyterians believe and do. Or is it? Presbyterians prefer to interpret scripture in terms of other scripture. We anticipate the presence of the living word in the revelation of the written word. In this case, we refer to our first passage, Paul's commentary to the Presbyterian Rome. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. It's worth noting that these commands all come from the second table, the one dealing with social relationships, not our relationship with God. To me, that suggests that the best way to get along with God is to get along with others and one's own self first. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. How much blending and sliding and easing goes on in groups because persons seek to be exceptions to the law without the common oversight of the group. Only nothing breaks the pattern of personal and group convenience that keeps the cycles of inequity spinning. If one is not part of the group in power, one cannot obtain equal privileges without spectacular achievement. As we said in the 1960s, a woman has to work twice as hard as a man for the same recognition. Fortunately, this is not difficult. You shall not commit adultery. Don't interfere with relationships in which you don't have a share. Respect others so that they will respect you. You shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Practice self-awareness and constancy of purpose, of integrity. Look for alternate forms of justice. Affirm all of life. Petition or earn what you lack or seek greater joy in what you already possess. All too often I find myself coming up short, not a particular commandment so much as a, a general indifference to another's needs. It's all I can do to take care of me and mine. Look out for yourself. We've managed to move from a godly economy of abundance to a human economy of scarcity. We perceive that another's gain is our loss. The slices always seem thinner. The pie never grows larger. This is what the world tells us. But love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. All too often, I find that that love exceeds my grasp. And yet, when I pause and look around, I find it within the group. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Working through this sermon, I have come to understand two things. First, machine-run discipline is as sin-filled as license masquerading as Christian liberty. And second, when Christ is not the center of our living or our social groups, we endanger ourselves and the group. If we do not hunger and thirst for righteous relationships, 
we unbalance the democracy of life before Christ. We know there are standards, and we are called to be always reforming ourselves according to the Word of God as we understand those standards in a particular day and time. So we need to pause and wait for the Spirit to move. Otherwise, our own fear pushes us to take steps too far off the beaten path, and we become lost in our own rush. You remember the definition of a fanatic is someone who redoubles their efforts when they've lost their way. Christ calls us together for Christ's own sake. Imperfect and sinful as we are, Christ also abides with us so that we may gather comfort, peace, strength, and wisdom as persons and people of faith. We are not left to our own devices. We are not stuck in ourselves. As we proceed through these troubled days, let us stand for the right as we understand right, and let us seek the wisdom of the church. Let us always be open to the reality and revelation of Jesus Christ, our common Lord. Amen. The tables at which we sit, wherever they may be, whenever we may be sitting at them, are the table of God when we come together and join together in the Lord's Supper. And so let us join in that supper together. For in the reign of God, people will come from north and south and east and west and sit at table uh, and be part of God's family. And so we celebrate communion together, remembering that in the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And after they had eaten, he took the cup saying, this is the new covenant poured out in my blood. Take and drink as often as you do this in remembrance of me. Virtually, we commune at our, each at our own tables, and you may feel free to commune at this time with me, or you can wait until the time in our virtual coffee hour during which we will commune together. So if you are communing with me now, the bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ, and the cup which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us share together in prayer. Let us pray. Only one in three before the foundations of the world, you intended us for love. At the foundation of the world, you blessed those efforts, called them good, and made us in your own image to be stewards of your creation. At the completion of the world, you will make all things new, life fully perfected in your purpose and passion. Hear the prayers of this people and all persons as they present themselves, soul, body, spirit, wounds, resources, and hopes into your welcoming sight and embrace. We pray for the church, for this congregation and other courts and congregations of saints. We acknowledge that even our best efforts contain conceit and claim more than they may deliver. Prosper and secure the work and witness of our fathers. Keep us mindful that your presence abides and blesses our efforts in your service. Keep us mindful that you are always near when hardship befalls us. Keep us mindful that death and all the sin of the world could not, in the fullness of time, separate us from your love, made known, made real in Jesus Christ. We pray for our nation and all political institutions. Keep us from fearsome reactivity to threats imagined and real. Keep us surrounded by your peace that our own fear and anger against those who would believe otherwise from us would give full worth and value to their humanity. 
let us see and hear truly, that our hearts may know wisely, and that our hands serve with care and craft. We pray for the world, its deep beauty and fragile structures, where fire, drought, flood, or destroy forests, farmland, and housing. Sustain us in emergency responses. Give perseverance and knowledge to guide conservation and rehabilitation. Keep us from isolation and complacency. God, we know your will for us as life and group. Continue with us in this COVID-19 pandemic. Let each of us find ways to help all of us against this pestilence. Remind us that in life and in death, we belong to you. Those in distress, oppressed by illness, joblessness, homelessness, hunger, loneliness, and the certainty that death would only improve their circumstances, we commend to you, O Saving One. May Holy Spirit rest upon them to nourish and sustain hope. May our words, our community, our offering be part of efforts that affirm that we are our, your beloved community. Gather together these prayers and bind them with mercy and love, that we may be called and claimed, given and gifted to share your love. By Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
as we go from this time, may we be strengthened by the Spirit and held together by our one hope and our one faith. And may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May God's countenance be lifted up upon you and give you peace now and forever. Amen.